Motoring 93 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service. Trust your car to Midas. It looks like a red rocket. In fact, it drives like one. But it's better known as the Nissan 300ZX. It first came on the market in 1990. This is the new 93 model. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 93. Now there have been very few changes to this car over the years, but then again, why should there be? When you're packing six cylinders, 300 horsepower and twin turbos. Later we'll take a closer look at the 300 as well as its 2 plus 2 stable mate. And obviously if you owned a car like this you would not be thinking about going off road. But if you were, well, we're now going to show you what I think is the grand fromage, the big cheese of off road vehicles. And as you're about to see, this vehicle can really hum. It's called the Hummer. It's a one of a kind and is being billed as the world's most serious off-highway vehicle. From the sands of the Persian Gulf to the showrooms of America, for the first time, a civilian version. First time, one to call your own. Now, at a dealer near you, the new American legend. Well, it started in the late 70s. The U.S. Army came up with a performance requirement not what the vehicle would look like, but what they wanted it to do. It had to have a certain amount of ground clearance, be able to climb certain slopes, carry a certain load, so many people, fit in certain aircraft, not be taller than but uh, or wider than a certain thing. That dictated sort of the envelope of the vehicle, and then they wanted certain performance characteristics to include real strength, durability, long life. Uh, there were three companies that competed to meet that requirement, and we were one of them, and we won in uh, 1983. The Hummer was actually designed by our engineers uh, in late 1979, in a very short period of time, from a blank piece of paper. It isn't an evolution or an adaptation of any existing thing. It's really a revolutionary. The design of the chassis is unlike anything else on the face of the earth. Prices, in simple terms, are in the 50s. Uh, the pickup truck version, without anything on it, is 46550 that's the manufacturer suggested retail price and if you get the wagon the one behind me with everything on it i think it's a hair over 60 but most of the models and option prices range in somewhere in the 50s we described the cruising speed as 65 you know, on a nice day without a heavy load you may almost be able to hit 80 uh, although of course that would be speeding but uh, it'll cruise at 65 all day long uh, it's not a vehicle that's intended to be a long distance highway cruiser, but most people are startled at how smoothly it rides and how well it handles. Uh, it's got independent suspension on in all four wheels, power steering, power brakes, automatic transmission, it's very easy to drive. The power comes from a General Motors 6.2 liter V8 diesel engine, three speed automatic transmission. Uh, there's a two speed transfer case, torque sensing differentials front and rear, so it's a full time four wheel drive vehicle. It's, it's really unique characteristics come from the amazing ground clearance. There's 16 inches clear under the vehicle, no differential humps, no axles, uh, tremendous wheel travel with the independent suspension, tremendous power to the wheels from the diesel power plant. This for us as a company is, is a real adventure. We can't steal anybody's clothes. It's so different from any other vehicle that we really have to kind of write the book about what the market for this vehicle is, what the uses are. We're trying to teach the world what the vehicle will do. We know that the world will teach us that there are applications for it that we haven't dreamed of. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive, we look at the 1994 Chrysler New Yorker. Now, in the past, they've used many nautical names to describe that particular nameplate. Land Yacht is probably one of the most frequently used. In this week's Test Drive, you'll learn that this New Yorker is anything but a Land Yacht. The New Yorker's competition includes the Cadillac Seville, Mercedes-Benz 300E, Lincoln Continental and the Buick Park Avenue. Lofty competition indeed. It is notable that all of these are vastly more expensive. 
50,000 plus versus about 34,000 for a loaded New Yorker. Power is provided by the same 3.5 litre 24 valve V6 that was introduced in the original LH models. With power rated at 214 horses and 221 pounds feet of torque, one might expect performance to be quick. At 9 seconds to the 100k mark, it is certainly spirited. Out on the highway, the thing purrs along, meaning you get the best of both worlds. The hitch in the get along is the transmission and the upshift strategy Chrysler have adopted. In order to attain desirable fuel economy, the transmission upshifts as soon as it possibly can. The result is, at 50 to 60 k, the engine is lugging badly at about 1600 RPM. This type of RPM happens to be a country mile out of the power band. The result is that the transmission is constantly hunting between gears. A rethink of the transmission strategy is desperately in order, especially in the sportier LHS. Fuel economy averaged a respectable 23 miles per gallon or 12.3 litres per 100 kilometres. That by way of interest is the same as the lighter LH models. No pylon test on this week's test drive, but what we have managed to do is to find a nice twisty piece of roadway and it'll do as a substitute very nicely. Now given that this is a luxury oriented automobile, this car is handling this rather tortuous piece of blacktop very nicely indeed. Chrysler are to be commended for the job they've done on the suspension. As well as coming with standard anti-lock brakes, the New Yorker also comes with traction control. On slippery surfaces, the system limits wheel spin, enabling the car to pull away. Without the system, it will be difficult to say the least. The nice part of this setup is that it allows the driver a certain amount of latitude before intervening. For the record, I required 118 feet to stop the New Yorker from 80k. The redesign on the New Yorker is radical to say the very least. You'll find no white walls, no fake wire wheel hubcaps, no opera lamps and especially no vinyl roof. In fact, they went to the effort of designing the back end here such as to make it impossible to add an aftermarket vinyl roof. As one engineer told us during the tech session, trying to put a vinyl roof on this curved surface will be like trying to wallpaper a bowling ball. Inside, the New Yorker has been very tastefully decked out. The old sofa-style seats have been replaced with an orthopedically correct split bench seat that features eight-way adjustment for both halves. There is also a full complement of power items including mirrors, locks and windows, along with cruise control and a wonderful sounding Infinity stereo system that features a built-in graphic equaliser. Below the stereo are the climate controls. The system can be operated either in an automatic or manual mode. The nice part about the controls is that they are large and extremely easy to use, even with gloves on. To round things off and add a touch of elegance, their words not mine, there is the obligatory strip of fake wood. Unlike other manufacturers, however, who destroy some rare and unusual trees to create the effect, Chrysler have opted for real plastic, recyclable plastic at that. The dash is analog, easy to interpret and readily viewed through the top portion of the steering wheel. The latter holds true even when the steering wheel is moved through its entire range. There is also a roof mounted trip computer that includes a compass and outside temperature. The front half of this New Yorker is pretty much the same as the front half of the Chrysler Concorde. However, the back half of the car is quite different. The revised roof line has allowed them to move the rear seat back another three inches. That gives you limo-like leg room in the back. In the trunk area, they've added another five inches to the back of the car. Now that gives them 18 cubic feet of trunk space. And that is enormous by anybody's standards. The LHS version differs from the New Yorker in as much as it is aimed at a sportier buyer. To that end, there is a floor-mounted console, better seats that offer much improved support, and a suspension that is firmer and more in keeping with the car's sportier pretensions. The standard 16-inch wheels and better tyres also help things enormously. On the safety front, all things are in place. Dual airbags, traction control and ABS. As the general manager of Chrysler explained, traditional New Yorker buyers have matured themselves out of existence. That being the case, this car has the ingredients to make it very popular with a younger crowd. To quote an old and rather hackneyed expression, they don't make them like they used to. Thank goodness for that. 
Although it's been on the market only three years, the Nissan 300ZX has already made an impressive mark in the luxury performance market. But it's a market that has also been affected by the recession. Sales of the 300 in the United States dropped from 22,000 in 1990 to just under 10,000 in 92. But Nissan is not panicking. Well, as the market uh, retreats, these are the kind of cars that people can easily not buy. Uh, you know, it's a lot of money and it's kind of a toy and, and you can make other decisions to either spend your money another way or simply save it. So, well, we don't look at it as pressure because we want the car to be sold to people who really want to buy it and we're not out there to try to sell 3,000 or 5,000 or 10,000. What we'll sell is what we're happy with. The engines for the two vehicles, the two-seater and the two-plus two, are identical. Um, we only offer the turbo engine in the two-seater, and that's the sort of high-performance ultimate car, really. But uh, manual transmission, automatic transmission, leather interior, all of the goodies are exactly the same between the two-seater and the two-plus two. The two-seater starts at about 44,000, and uh, the, the uh, two-seater turbo is uh, 50,000. The uh, two-plus two is about 46. Usually at this point in the program, we join Bill Gardner in the garage, but we're going to try something just a little different this week. You know, over the years, we've had people ask how Bill got started in the business and why he wanted to become an auto mechanic. Well, to try and find some answers, we're not going to head to the garage. We're going to head to the classroom. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking on uh, General Motors Systems Update. The main topic of the evening is going to be the central port injection system. Uh, which is, was introduced last year on General Motors uh, light trucks and uh, the minivans and the small trucks. And it looks like it's going to have lots of application in other uh, uh, GM uh, vehicles down the road. This shows that there are tiny when his working schedule permits, Bill Gardner heads to the classroom to help stay on top of the latest in automotive technology. And for the past 15 years, Bill has relied on one person for his information. Well, that man is Ron Brown. Well, I met Bill Gardner about 1978. I was putting on automotive training courses uh, in the Toronto area. Bill heard about the programs and uh, was one of the fellows that came to my, my courses in, in the very early stages of my business. I started business in 1977, by the way. Bill's always been very interested in keeping up to date, and uh, that's what my business is all about, helping to keep mechanics up to date. One of the first things, uh, one of the first things he showed me was uh, at the time Ford, uh, early 80s, Ford had a carburetor they called a variable Venturi carburetor, and it was uh, it was scaring the heck out of all the guys in the trade how to repair it. And he showed me how to rebuild one, and uh, none of the guys around me wanted to touch one, including the the local dealership, and they were just putting new ones out of boxes on the cars, and it was a horrendous price, of course. They never did figure them out, and Ron showed me. You know, he just simplified it for me and showed me basically how it worked and he showed me a couple of tricks to make it work for a long time. There were a few little places you had to drill it and tweak it here and there and uh, we sort of became quite a little legend in our area, you know, that we, we were the guys that could fix those carburetors and even the dealer was sending us work. This next uh, slide... First of all, I am a mechanic and have been for about 40 years. And the last 15 years I've been in business for myself training mechanics. Uh, in between, before that, uh, I was working for different uh, companies and I always wound up doing training of mechanics and apprentices. And I've spent some time in training institutions as well. So I've had a good broad background in automotive training. And in the late 70s, when it was obvious that we were going to be going into fuel injection and computer controls and more electronics in the cars, uh, I felt that this was the time that uh, training was going to be needed to help uh, update mechanics all across the country. And that's what my business is all about. So it has the features of a throttle body injection system with one injector, but it's also got the features of a port fuel injection system where the fuel is delivered at the intake ports. That's where the name central port injection comes from. So this is a And of course, almost all of the mechanical systems on cars today are controlled by electronics. And the problem that automotive mechanics have faced is trying to keep up to date with all the new developments but it's like having to learn a whole new trade because uh, they never needed to know much about electrical and electronic things before, but now they do. And uh, so some fellows are going to fall by the wayside uh, as they retire or, or get into work where they don't have to have it. So the ones that are interested in keeping in the trade, they're, they're trying hard. Here's the pressure regulator. 
neat small unit that uh, it's a new type. It's uh, got factory adjustment and it's brazed so that it can't be changed. It's got a filter uh, screen over the end of it so that any fuel that goes through the, the uh, pressure regulator en route to the tank, it gets filtered there also. This is after the injector. There's a, there's a great future for young people in the automotive business. People are used to driving cars. They're always going to be on the road. They might give up a lot of other things, but they won't give up their car. And sooner or later, it has to be fixed. Uh, where a lot of other trades are changing, the automotive trade is, is changing, but it's going to be here and it's going to be with us for many years to come. And my recommendation is if young people are considering the, biz the trade today, there's a br really bright future. It's no longer a greasy, dirty trade that it used to be. I'm not saying that you're not going to get your hands dirty, because you are. But hands can be cleaned. And if done properly, they can stay clean. Uh, so I'm, I'd be, and I'd, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend it. My dad was in the business, and uh, it rubbed off on me. It so happens that my family, uh, my boys, are not interested in it, but uh, I, I don't feel upset about that at all. You know, the, you can never stop learning. I mean, you can never know too much, you know. And uh, you can learn from anybody. And as soon as you can sort of tame your ego and figure out that you don't know everything, you, you're, you're ready to learn. A few weeks back, Motoring 93 was on location in Barbados. While there, we had a chance to view a collection of the country's oldest automobiles. There is no such thing as a motor museum in Barbados. This is the first one of its kind. We have an active motor club that has been going since 1957. So this museum will also be a historic record of that club and also the Barbados Automobile Association, which is affiliated to the AA in England and the AAA in the States. And this would be a museum for them as well. Basically, I intend to open a small museum. This is a Vandenpla Princess made by the Austin Motor Company. This particular car was one of three produced specially for the heads of governments. This one was for Barbados. There was another one similar made for the Governor General of Trinidad and one for Mauritius. As far as we know, this is the only one that is left. This came to Barbados in 1965. It is different to any other princess that is left in the world as far as we know in that the roof line is three inches higher than the normal princess. This was to accommodate the colonial governor's ceremonial headdress, which was a helmet with a plume. I will just show you an unusual feature of this car. It has a very quick action window winder so that the chauffeur could get the window up or down very, very quickly. Now let me show you the oldest working car in Barbados belonging to David Edwards. This is a 1933 Austin 10. 10 horsepower. Um, this was the common form of transport in the early 30s here in Barbados. This car came here new and to the best of our knowledge is now the oldest working car in the island. It's been completely restored recently and uh, there's very little to be done now. The tires need to be changed because they are not really the original type. Other than that, it's in no original condition. This is my newest acquisition and perhaps my favorite one. It is a Citroen 1953 model, Big 15, built in England at the English factory of the Citroen, which is really a French manufacturer. This car came to Barbados in 1979, having been restored in England. This car is such a new acquisition to me, I have not even had a chance to drive it yet. I plan on driving it home this evening, and hopefully I'll get there with it quite successfully. I have no doubt I will. Naturally, one of the first places tourists head for when visiting Barbados is the beach. All you need is a bathing suit and some sunscreen. Swimwear manufactured in Barbados has become very popular, and Motoring 93 was fortunate to receive a private fashion show. We're looking at the North American market. Um, I know the competition out there is tough, but I think because we've got our own look and it's very curvy and, and you know it's a true um, island flair that um, that plays a very important part. We, we don't want to go and do what um, the North American companies are doing because you can get that up there. You want something different.
A lot of our suits are wired because this is what the market is calling for and our bottoms are quite small in actual fact these bottoms are big for us here in Barbados because the girls actually like them a bit smaller than this but um, we've got to bear in mind that um, we're trying to gear towards the um, international market, extra regional and I'm not sure that everybody's going to wear them quite as small as the girls wear them here. For the older folks that um, still they, they've still, still got good um, bodies and you know they want to get into these suits and of course once you're here in Barbados you want to get maximum sunshine so they, with that in mind they still tend to wear them as small as they're brave enough to wear them. Our Midas tip of the week concerns telltale signs of alternator failure. I'm sure you're all aware that the battery on today's vehicles is rated at 12 volts, but it's the job of a unit like this, the alternator out under the hood of the car, to keep the system voltage boosted to around 14 and a half volts anytime the engine's running. That charges the battery and keeps all the accessories working in the intended fashion. Now if you notice accessories like the heater, turn signals, wiper motor, etc., working in a lazy or slow fashion or that your headlights are kind of yellow and dim, that's a good indication that the alternator may not be working up to scratch. If you notice that symptom, curtail the use of as many accessories as you can, consult the dashboard gauges or idiot lights to see if there's any sign of a problem, and check under the hood simple things like belt condition and tension. Could be as simple as a slipping or missing cracked fan belt. In any case, you want to get that system looked at in fairly short order because at that stage of the game you're working on just the battery and you won't go for long before that car dies on the road. That's your Midas tip of the week. I've got a super highway behind me. I've got urban roads all around me, but I think I'm in the most dangerous spot of all. I'll be right back in Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. You know I get grumpy enough about the way some people drive on roads, but what's really scary is the way they drive on parking lots. Now one car maker, Cadillac, even has a warning in the owner's manual about this. Drivers going way too fast, ignoring one-way signs, diving across five lanes to get that one perfect spot 10 feet closer to the mall entrance. But think about the kind of drivers you're dealing with here. First of all, they're mall shoppers. Secondly, they're paying no attention to you. They're looking left and looking right, also trying to find that perfect spot. You got moms and dads with parcels stacked up to here, kids running back to the van with their new toys, or seniors pushing their shopping carts. This is dangerous stuff. Now, police don't have radar traps in parking lots, but if you do something wrong, you can still be charged. And if you have a crash, you're still going to be charged and be liable for it, and your car will be no less damaged. So next time you come to the mall, bear this in mind. Head up, eyes wide open, and easy does it. I'm Jim Kenzie. When you buy a car like the Nissan 300ZX, let's face it, you're buying it for performance, not practicality. But one of the things I like about this car is that when you do open the hatchback, not only do you have a privacy cover, you actually have a place to put a couple of suitcases. Performance and convenience. And if you happen to have between forty-five dollars and $50,000 lying around, it's the car for you. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 93 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. While in Barbados, the Motoring 93 crew stayed at the beautiful Tamarind Cove.